Good evening, everyone, and welcome to this symposium, When Nature Goes to Court, organized in collaboration between Elsa Tilburg and Studium General. ELSA, European Law Student Association, enriches law students academically and professionally through various activities. The area of seminars and conferences in ELSA gives law students and young lawyers from different countries and legal systems the opportunity to discuss and learn about different legal topics that are not usually dealt within the university curriculum. I'm Susie, the Vice President in charge of seminars and conferences at ELSA Tilburg, and it's a pleasure to host this event in collaboration with Studium General. Studium General organizes a wide range of lectures, like this one, focusing on current social issues. For students, you might be interested in Studium General certificate. By attending five lectures and writing a short personal reflection, you can earn the certificate. More details can be found on their website. We are here today to discuss a profound shift in how we understand and address the relationship between the environment and our legal systems. One of the clearest examples of this shift is the landmark case Milieu Defense versus Royal Dutch Shell. In this historic lawsuit, an environmental group called Milieu Defense, along with thousands of co-plaintiffs, sued Shell, one of the world's largest oil companies in the Dutch court. The court ruled that Shell must reduce its carbon dioxide emissions by 45% by 2030. This ruling is remarkable because it's the first time a court has told a private company that it must follow the climate goals set out in the Paris Agreement, which is an international deal to combat climate change. What makes this case truly extraordinary is that it reflects a new wave of climate litigation. As governments often struggle to take decisive action, courts are stepping in, recognizing the urgent need for environmental protection and the rights of nature. This legal evolution is mirrored globally with rivers, forests and ecosystems being granted legal rights, demanding that we rethink our responsibilities toward the natural world. Today, we will hear from three different speakers, each offering a unique perspective on what happens when nature goes to court. They will guide us through how legal systems are increasingly recognizing the rights of nature and holding corporations accountable for environmental harm. As Professor Philip Payment states in his paper, this lawsuit represents a reimagining of the energy corporation as an actor both responsible for and vulnerable to the harmful consequences of a changing climate. To explore this further, it's my pleasure to invite Professor Philip Payment to take the stage and delve deeper into the significance of this landmark case. Right. Can you hear me all right? Is the microphone on? Yeah? Fantastic. Thank you, Susie, for the kind words of introduction. Um, so yes, I'm going to uh, introduce the Milieu Defense case to you guys here today. I'm curious, how many people in the audience have heard about the case before, feel like they know something about it? All right. Maybe a third or so. Fantastic. Um, so the Milieu Defense uh, case uh, was decided by the, the district court in, in and is already on appeal, and we expect an appellate judgment, I believe, uh, next month in November. Yeah. Yeah, I, yeah, I was also yeah. thinking that it was not on, but it says it is on. Okay. Yeah. yeah. All right. Um, and the case uh, uh, asks, uh, essentially, uh, at its core, what is the duty of care that Royal Dutch Shell, uh, the largest emitter of, of emissions based in the Netherlands, what is the duty of care that it has to Dutch residents regarding climate change mitigation? And to understand that question, for those of you who are not lawyers or not studying law, you need to understand that uh, in, in private law, we all have duties of care to each other. Anyone we're coming into a factual relationship with, in relationship in a very broad sense, uh, we have a duty of care to. Um, and that is to say, we have a duty to act carefully with respect to them, not to harm their legal interests. Uh, and if we do cause harm to them, or if our actions are likely to cause harm to them, that uh, affects the kind of obligations we have to, to act carefully with respect to them. Uh, and so the question that Milieu Defensi and the, the co-plaintiffs bring here is, well, what does that mean for, for Shell as the largest emitter in this country uh, with respect to Dutch residents who have a series of uh, uh, future effects that they are going to experience if climate change is not mitigated? Right? 
there will be flooding, there will be salinization of drinking water, there will be uh, large sections of the country that, uh, that there will not, uh, we, will, we will have to not, not build homes on uh, to uh, give way to flood zones and um, uh, uh, water storage for drought that will have economic consequences for farmers. Uh, there will be costs associated with isolating homes because of uh, uh, extreme weather. Uh, there's all sorts of effects that this will have on Dutch residents. Uh, and the question is, what does Shell owe to them then? And that, that could be anywhere on the spectrum of, you know, uh, they should report what their emissions are to they need to uh, reduce emissions immediately or as soon as possible, right? Anywhere on the large spectrum. The case builds on the Urgenda decision uh, from 2019 uh, uh, in terms of the human rights implications of climate change on Dutch citizens. Uh, which was clearly uh, uh, set out in the agenda case. Um, and it then shifts attention to what the duty of care in that case of the Dutch state was, to now what is the duty of care of the largest private um, uh, emitter of emissions. It also builds on um, a decade of increasing scientific sophistication uh, around the contribution of major emitters. Uh, so we're coming increasingly in the, uh, across this term carbon majors. And carbon majors is a way of articulating the uh, private actors that are most responsible for this historical buildup of emissions. Uh, and this comes from a project headed by uh, a researcher in the US named Richard Heed, uh, in which they, they conducted a historical analysis to piece together um, uh, the, the uh, historic emissions of all of these major emitting countries. For the most part, we're talking about energy companies, oil and gas companies, transport com companies, and a few kind of heavy industrial sectors like cement uh, production. Um, and with that, they can begin to articulate not just how much you know, Shell has emitted last year or two years ago or five years ago, but if you would look from when Shell was first incorporated as a company, decades and decades and decades ago to today, what proportion of the greenhouse gases that have been added to the atmosphere by human activities have been added by that individual company? And that's important because it begins to tell us about their proportionate responsibility to mitigate climate change. If they are responsible for 2% of global emissions, then conceivably a just kind of analysis would suggest that they should be responsible for mitigating 2% uh, uh, as well. Um, this case was brought by Milieu Defense, so it's an environmental NGO. Um, uh, it was brought uh, as a algemeen belong or a public interest case on behalf of uh, all Dutch residents, essentially, uh, representing both present and future generations of Dutch residents. Uh, there was also some 17,000 individual claimants in the case who, if I remember correctly, were, were removed from the case by the courts because the way in which they experienced climate change was not uh, individually differentiated. That is to say, there was nothing unique about how climate change would affect them from how it would affect other Dutch residents. And so they couldn't have standing to bring a case as an individual, uh, which is why the case was, was led predominantly as a public interest claim on behalf of all residents, as a, as a kind of class action, you might say, right? Um, and it's, pro it's also important to note that there was one other plaintiff removed from the case, and that's an organization called Action Aid, who sought to represent the interests of, um, of a number of communities in sub-Saharan Africa uh, in the case as well. And the court removed that, saying that the, the way in which climate change affects other regions of the world is too different to include in a single analysis with the way that it affects Dutch residents, because it's going to affect them at different time periods, in different intensities and in different ways. And so the duty of care, conceivably the duty of care that Shell would have to those communities would be differentiated from the duty of care it would have for Dutch residents. And the court only wants to deal with one analysis at a time. Um, all right, so the question, what is Shell's duty of care, right? Uh, and this comes out of uh, a Dutch tort law, on uh from, from book six, article 162 of the, of the civil code. Uh, under the, the, what's called the unwritten standard of care uh, in Dutch tort law. Um, and the question is, so we have this, this unwritten standard of care, this kind of common public understanding of what the acceptable form of care is vis-a-vis -vis each other in a given context. And the, and the question that the court faces in cases like this is, how do we substantiate that? How do we give meaning to fill in what that care is in this concrete scenario, right? Um, and I would say very specifically, the court needs to figure out if, if Shell has a duty to mitigate emissions, if that's part of their duty of care, then the next question that becomes very evident is, 
is it any different than the duty of care that the Dutch state owes to its residents? That is to say, 25% uh, mitigation rate by 2020, 55% by 2030, and net zero emissions by 2050, roughly speaking, right? This is the, the trajectory um, that's agreed upon in the, in the Paris Agreement uh, that would lead to um, uh, a not more than likely scenario of, of two degrees warming. Um, and so in order to substantiate what this standard of care is in the specific case, the, the court turns to a number of different types of, of documents, some of them legal documents, some of them scientific documents, some of them kind of uh, 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 scientific reports or kind of uh, non-binding normative documents as well. They turn to human rights instruments to articulate the way in which the human rights of Dutch citizens might be affected by climate change, property rights, rights to health, um, rights to, to, to private and family life. Uh, they do that in the context of the European Convention of Human Rights, the International Covenant on Civil and Political Rights. Um, they look at documents which seek to translate because the human rights instruments address obligations that states have to their citizens. Right? Uh, but here we're not dealing with a relationship between a state and a citizen. We're dealing with a relationship between a Dutch resident and a Dutch company. And so they look at human rights instruments that seek to transpose those rights to the private context of companies and individuals. So the UN GPs um, and, and the OECD guidelines on multinational enterprises, both of which are, are international uh, legal instruments that articulate the human rights obligations that um, multinational enterprises or large um, corporate actors have uh, um, uh, in, in their business actions. It looks to the Paris Agreement in a very similar way that the Urgenda case does, to say, look, the Paris Agreement sets out um, a, a global consensus that more than two degrees warming is unacceptable. So there's a, a normative standard that that has to be a, a, a guiding framework for understanding a, a duty of care within the Netherlands. What kind of actions would be consistent with um, maintaining a less than two degrees warming scenario? Um, and then it looks at uh, IPCC cli uh, climate science reports to understand what kind of mitigation uh, rates, what kind of emissions reductions rates in 2030 and 2040 and 2050 would be necessary in order, not to guarantee, but to make it more likely than not that we stay within that two degree warming uh, scenario. Um, and then finally, and I think this is perhaps one of the most um, controversial parts of the decision from the district court that will probably be scrutinized in the appellate court. They refer to what they call, the, the judges call the Oxford Report, which is a, it was a report made by a group of climate scientists and climate governance scholars, um, which ends up being a very kind of key document in the decision. Because even going through where we're at up until this point, it's still not clear. Does Shell owe any more or less mitigation uh, obligations than the Dutch state does, which in her agenda was found to, to be required to reduce emissions by 25% 20, uh, by 2020 and conceivably 55% by 2030. Um, and the Oxford report uh, suggests that for major emitters, they need to reduce emissions equivalent to the reduction rates of states. And that's for the court helpful because it, it offers them this translation to say, we don't need to figure out this um, calculation in the private sector anew. We can just use the same reduction rates that we've been using to evaluate the duty of care of the Dutch state and apply it directly onto to Shell. And now that's controversial. It's controversial because uh, it suggests or assumes that all sectors within Dutch society, all industrial sectors and consumption sectors, ought to reduce emissions at the same rate. Right? All of them ought to reduce them by 25% by 2020, 55% by 2030, and net zero by 2050. Um, that's a kind of ideal picture of the world. Right? But some sectors are much harder to reduce than others. Some sectors are functionally impossible to reduce, air transportation, for instance. Um, there are some heavy industries where it's, at the moment, we don't have techno technologies available to remove emissions. Um, and some sectors are really easy to reduce. Heating of homes, it's really easy to reduce uh, emissions in heating of homes compared to some other sectors through better insulation, through uh, shifting to um, uh, electrical forms of, of, of house warming, for instance. 
Um, and so it's not, it's not necessarily taken for granted that all of these sectors ought to do this. And I think that's why there's going to be a lot of scrutiny on this in the uh, appellate judgment. Um, there's been a lot of critique of this judgment. Uh, yes, it's also been kind of heralded as one of the first successful cases pinning liability on a private actor for failing to take um, sufficient climate action in the world. Um, and, and the Netherlands with the Urgenda case and now this one continues to be kind of placed on the forefront of um, you know, evolving uh, legal standards related to the climate crisis. Uh, but there's been a lot of criticism as well. The first is that the harm, the human rights impacts of climate change are not redressable by the court's, act, the court's order. So the court ordered uh, Shell, I, I guess I buried the, the lead here, the court ordered Shell to reduce, to develop a climate policy for its company that reduced emissions by 55% by 2030 and was a net neutral emitter by 2050. Um, and the critique, the first point of critique is that this doesn't solve the human rights impacts on which the case is based. Right? Even if Shell does this, uh, residents in the Netherlands are still uh, exposed to uh, the risk of human rights violations, right? Because it, we don't, the outcome of this doesn't affect more than, I think, like uh, one and a half percent of global emissions, right? So it's not a redressable form of harm. There's a risk of emissions shift. So you're, you're, uh, you're saying, okay, that human rights are likely to be harmed if there isn't more aggressive climate action. You're explaining the court's ordering one company to reduce its emissions. Well, what's gonna prevent them from just offloading the activities responsible for those emissions to a different oil and gas company, to a different energy company, right? Then Shell is con in conformity with its, with its order from the court, but at a kind of global or even national analysis, there's no actual reduction in emissions. Uh, there was a critique of the, the soft law norms, the UNGPs, the OECD's um, uh, guidelines on multinational enterprises, that these are un undemocratic or unrepresentative, and it's true. These are not documents that have uh, binding authority. They're not the product of, of the deliberation of, of the United Nations as a, as a democratic body in that sense. They, they lack, in, in many ways, the democratic legitimacy of, of the Paris Agreement or, or national climate laws. Right? Um, there's a question about enforceability. We're in a moment now when the courts are kind of instituting larger and larger uh, uh, judgments against the Dutch state, against powerful actors in the Netherlands, and having trouble enforcing those judgments. Um, and what would enforcement look like in this case? Maybe a, a penalty, a fine, uh, or a penalty for every month that they uh, fail to conform with the judgment. Again, um, the duty here is, it, it's a, a best effort duty. So it's not premised on them actually reducing emissions by 55% uh, by 2030 and net zero by 2050. But Shell needs to show that they've done their best effort to do so, that they've developed the policies that ought to lead them there, that they're executing those policies in good faith, right? Um, but it becomes more and more difficult to, inf inf to, to understand, well, what would that look like to enforce it? Particularly because Shell has now since moved out of this jurisdiction. It's now based in the United Kingdom. Uh, and much of the emissions of Shell uh, take place outside of the Netherlands. This case is not just about scope one emissions, so the emissions from Shell's immediate operations. It's not just about its scope one and scope two emissions. Scope two is the emissions that come from generating power to, 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 to power uh, Shell's business operations, but also importantly, Shell's scope three emissions, which is any of the emissions that come out of the products or the services it sells. So all of the emissions that come out of the oil and gas that Shell sells on the market to consumers, to industrial actors, are included within this judgment. Um, and those take place all over the world. Uh, finally, there's critique about how Shell's um, current activities are contextualized within its industry. Shell, of course, presents itself as one of the most sustainable oil and gas companies. Uh, not just in the Netherlands, but in the world. Um, and uh, typically, in a case like this, one would substantiate this duty of care, the unwritten standard of care, by taking considerable um, inference out of the best practices of the industry in which the actor's operating. Right? 
uh, best practices tend to lead a lot of insight into what it means to act with care with respect to other people who might be harmed by your activities. Um, now the problem here, and this is something that I, that I engage with very directly in, in the um, case, uh, case note that, that Susie introduced. The problem, of course, is that the entire industry is acting right now in a manner that's grossly inconsistent with the Paris Agreement and with coming to a, a carbon neutral future by 2050. Uh, so they're acting in grossly inconsistent with um, limiting global warming to maximum two degrees Celsius. So even the best practices within the industry, if we're looking at oil and gas companies as the industry, is, um, is not sufficient for steering behavior that would, that would reduce the likelihood of human rights violations. Now, from another perspective, one might say, why are we comparing Shell just with oil and gas companies? Shell also sells energy from solar panels, and it sells energy from wind turbines. And there are many energy companies now in Europe that are exclusively selling renewable energy. Uh, and if, if those are included within the best practices of emissions mitigation, then Shell all of a sudden looks like quite a bit of a laggard in comparison to a 100% renewable-based energy company. Uh, and so part of the question that the judges are, are faced with is, what is an energy company today and in the future? What is an energy company that is consistent with the Paris Agreement and consistent with a max two degrees warming scenario? Now, they don't address this directly head on, of course. They're, in, they're addressing that question implicitly. Um, finally, I wanna, I wanna put the, the case in the context of regulatory failure, because I think a lot of people, when they, when they read about the Milieu de, uh, Defense case against Shell, in the newspaper, when they hear about it, they, it, it doesn't really set in the legislative context in which this is coming out. One of my uh, good friends and a colleague from the University of Amsterdam, Laura Burgers, described the case saying that the judgment should be read as a call to the legislature to come up, finally come up with more detailed guidelines for various actors in society at large, so as to ensure that the government's own target is achieved. Because Shell, as an oil and gas company, doesn't have legislative guidance about how it needs to reduce its emissions over time. Right? There are some sectors that do have very clear legislative guidance from parliament as to how quickly they need to reduce emissions as actors within a particular industrial sector. Um, but for the most part, uh, it isn't clear how that's going to happen. There are many industries through which emissions reduction is being led entirely by consumer patterns, by consumer demand shifts so that the government isn't saying that these are the targets that key economic actors need to reach. It's just these are the subsidies and the economic tools we're gonna to use to shift consumption patterns, and industrial actors will shift their emissions, pattern, the emissions behavior in response to the shifting demand for their products and services. Um, and that's largely what we see in the context of, of oil and gas and energy. Um, uh, and certainly for scope three emissions, the Dutch government has set no kind of legislative oversight uh, as to, to Shell's uh, scope three emissions outside of the Netherlands. And this is similar to the financial sector, because Milieu de Fancy, after su being successful at the district court against Shell, subsequently launched a very similar lawsuit against ING, the bank, uh, premised on essentially the same arguments um, in a very similar kind of regulatory failure context in which there is no legislative framework for the financial industry in the Netherlands to guide them into how they need to reduce their emissions activities directly coming out of the bank through powering the, the energy that the banks need, but also through the scope three emissions that banks are responsible for, the emissions that come out of the projects and the activities that they finance through loans and through other financial instruments. Right? And finally, because this event is about rights of nature, <laughs> Uh, and I was asked to kind of do this, this balance of speak to rights of nature, but in a case in which actually there is really little to say about rights of nature. It is in many ways a very anthropocentric case. It is premised on the harm that climate change is gonna cause to individuals. Uh, and so the first thing I wanted to do is underline that both Urgenda and Milieu de Fancy have very little to say and are very, they're, they're very agnostic to rights of nature or the, um, the value of protecting uh, the living environment uh, for its own terms, uh, that's, that's really not, um, there's not a lot of traction of that in the climate cases that have been successful here in the Netherlands. But that, is, uh, that isn't the case everywhere, right? 
So I wanted to draw your attention to um, a number of cases where climate action is being, uh, you know, litigation attempts that's seeking to require more aggressive climate action um, by working through nature conservation law. So one example is the advisory opinion from ITLO, so the International Tribunal on the Law of the Sea. It's a, uh, an international court um, associated with the um, uh, UN Convention on the Law of the Sea. Uh, and in that convention, states are, that have signed that convention, that treaty, uh, have an obligation to take all necessary measures to prevent, reduce, and control pollution from the marine environment, from any source. And there's been a question for the past few years. Does that include carbon dioxide? Does that include uh, the harm of global warming as a, uh, in the sense that carbon dioxide might be understood to be a pollutant, um, which, which causes harm to the marine environment? And in their advisory opinion uh, from May, I believe, of this year, uh, they said emphatically, yes, states do have an obligation under this marine um, uh, environmental pollution clause to take more aggressive climate action. Uh, another example are in a, the use of environmental impact assessments. This is a, a tool within administrative law and administrative governance um, that's, that's, that's required when you know, kind of large-scale projects are, are being proposed and licensed. So if you want to build a new building or develop a new piece of land or uh, build infrastructure, um, you need to conduct an environmental impact assessment beforehand. Um, and recently, in the last 10 years here in Europe, uh, these have become tools to challenge the impact that climate change has um, from that project. So imagine that a coal energy facility is looking to get relicensed. Uh, environmental activists are seeing this relicensing moment as an, as an opportunity to challenge the, the, the failure of the energy um, uh, uh, company to consider what does the operation of that facility have in, uh, what does it contribute to climate change, and what is then the consequences of that contribution to climate change for the natural environment. Using these environmental impact assessments to challenge major op, uh, uh, emissions uh, uh, activities uh, has been successful in the United States to close some uh, two to 300 coal-fired electrical power plants under a campaign that the Sierra Club uh, launched in 2006, I believe, called Beyond Coal. Uh, and this, this, this tactic is now being used here in, in uh, the European Union. There's also some cases which do the opposite. They, they flip around and they seek uh, to enhance nature conservation measures uh, using the new uh, national climate laws which are being developed. So in Germany, in Sweden, in Finland, uh, Greenpeace, I believe, and Deutsche Umwelthilfe are bringing cases that seek to compel the states to protect more forest land because they see a contradiction. On the one hand, in their national climate laws, they claim that the forests are going to absorb X amount of emissions, but on the other hand, these organizations see that the forests needed to absorb those emissions are not being protected under the current forestry laws. And so they're looking for, uh, they're using the courts to try to protect broader amounts of forests in order to bring these two areas of law into alignment. And then finally, and this is perhaps the most evident uh, example of rights of nature being used in climate litigation, in the Belgian, misspelled, sorry, Belgian uh, Klimatzak, the, um, the Belgian equivalent of Urgenda, uh, the plaintiffs in that case sought to include 82 individual trees as co-plaintiffs that would, that would be um, uh, uh, members of the lawsuit uh, on their own terms. I include here a little section of the text uh, from the judgment. It was not accepted by the court. Um, it was an interesting experiment to try to push uh, the um, rights of nature uh, uh, kind of project, I would say, in Belgium not successful in the first instance here, but um, an attempt at least to start to think about what would it look like to articulate the way that climate change harms trees as individuals without thinking of it through the lens of, of humans. And so then I leave with, with a, a question that, that when, when I come into contact with rights of nature literature and scholarship, I'm always asking myself, how would this affect climate, and, climate change and environmental litigation? What kind of opportunities would rights of nature paradigms offer uh, to challenge national laws, to challenge the inactions of private actors, 
um, that it differs from what are available today. But I leave with the question, not with the answer. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Philip Payment, for the insightful presentation. Now I'm pleased to introduce our next speaker, Jimena Arenas Orbegazo, who will delve deeper into the rights of nature, focusing on the Colombian case, where courts have granted legal rights to species and recognize multi-species families. She will explore how this legal framework brings together indigenous communities, NGOs, scientists, and future generations to shape environmental policy, highlighting both its challenges and possibilities. Please join me in welcoming her. <laughs> Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's my pleasure to be here. It's always very inspiring to see students that are interested in the rights of nature. And it's very encouraging for my work. I am doing research at Tilburg University on the Colombian cases that have uh, enshrined rights of nature. And I hope with my presentation, you can start getting a bit of a glimpse to the question that Philip left us with. Um, in which way rights of nature can affect climate litigation and environmental litigation. I will show you some examples about what's happening in the Colombian scenario, particularly because you saw in the presentation of the event um, that the question was, what if nature had rights? What if the river could sue? In the Colombian scenario, we're not asking these questions anymore because rights of nature have already been uh, started to be enshrined in different legal instruments. So rather, the question is, how do we go about this? How do we implement them? What do they, these rights mean? How uh, we can include uh, marginalized communities, including nature as a marginalized community from, from the political debate, and how we can make uh, public policies that enable a living environment, not only for humans, but also for uh, members of other species and ecosystems more broadly. Um, I want to highlight that the cases that I am studying are cases where the typical forms of law that we are indoctrinated with at law school do not work. Environmental laws, human rights laws, are systematically being violated and these at the expense of the suffering of millions of victims that we count in a country with armed conflict. Digging into that, I want to place you for so those of you who are not quite sure where Colombia is, <laughs> because sometimes I'm asked this question, oh, Colombia, uh, Brazil, yeah, nearby. Yeah. Oh, Galatasaray, you have a Colombian uh, soccer player in your team or some other European teams or the fans of Tour de France remember sometimes Nairo Man or Botero, other cyclists uh, with heroic winnings. Um, the literature, our readers might know Gabriel Garcia Marquez, uh, the Nobel uh, winning prize. Um, maybe Shakira or Sofia Vergara are more familiar to Colombia. Um, and sadly, some of some others with other interests uh, have a, a vision of Colombia uh, more as a Netflix or Hollywood romanticization of drug lords and criminals. And so I want to show you something else about my country. Um, so this is a little bit of a larger block of the actual territory, but I wanted to point out that it's washed on the west with the Pacific Ocean. On the north, the Atlantic Ocean and more specifically the Caribbean Sea. Sharing a border with Panama, it's crossed by the Andean mountain chain. Uh, it shares the Amazon with Peru, um, Ecuador uh, and Brazil. And to the east, it's um, uh, neighboring Venezuela through plain lands uh, that connect ecologically fauna and flora from the Amazon and the Andean ecosystem with the Guyana bioregion. 
This geographic configuration makes a huge variety of climates, uh, landscapes, and that makes one of the most biodiverse countries on Earth. Uh, we have several UNESCO uh, biosphere reserves. We have several Ramsar sites, uh, World Heritage sites. Um, approximately a third of the total territory is under some regime of protected areas like natural parks, natu uh, national parks, uh, fauna and flora sanctuaries. Um, and on top of this biological diversity, there is a huge variety of indigenous groups with their own cultures, their own languages, um, the survival of which is uh, linked to the territories that they inhabit. Um, and all this richness in terms of natural resources is um, the trophy of contention between various economic actors uh, that want to uh, have huge plantations of palm oil trees. Um, of course, uh, these lands are very fertile for the production of cocaine and uh, heroin, uh, but also cattle ranching, um, solar panels, um, oil and gas, and especially um, the mining of gold, platinum, silver. Since the 1600s, the Spaniards came, they started to dig um, for gold, and it's 500 years later, they are still taking gold out of these regions. I have been focused on the first case where a national court in the world, in a final ruling, acknowledged an ecosystem as a legal person. Some of you may be familiar with it. It is called the Atrato case, the Atrato tutela, the Atrato ruling, and it's about a river where very severe pollution was being caused by mining and by logging. Um, basically, the trees are torn down, heavy machinery comes, reaches the water, um, the, the vicinity of the water, they throw mercury, which is the most toxic non-radioactive substance in the world, and other chemicals to extract gold primarily. This leaves uh, what used to be a flowing water body converted into a lagoon where all sorts of mosquitoes grow. They carry diseases like malaria or dengue uh, they infect people, and people who don't have access to healthcare uh, will face um, serious uh, um, illnesses, including also the death of people, and the ecosystems are destroyed, waters are poisoned, the areas that are dried uh, become deserts with toxic waste we don't know what we will be doing in decades time. As a result of this, a uh, humanitarian, social and ecological emergency was declared. Children were being, uh, were dying because of all these um, conditions. And the court faced the question, what do we do? The court realizes the problem is not what is written in the law, because we have a uh, human rights framework and an environmental framework that should do the work to prevent that this uh, um, heartbreaking environmental conditions occur. What's not written in the law is a series of dynamics where economic actors are fighting for these lands. This is driving the conflict and this is driving the pollution of the areas. And the court decides that the Atrato River Basin will have representation as a legal person for the management of the river. And it created a uh, multi-stakeholder, intersectorial, international governance framework uh, so that different communities sit on the table to figure out 
Collis is moving ahead. Um, what happened afterwards is a cascade of litigation seeking the recognition of other ecosystems as subjects of rights. I am not a very good cartographer, but I couldn't find a map that tells which areas are now falling under a regime of rights of nature. So forgive my, uh, my roughness, um, but so I want to briefly give you a glance. The Atrato River, what, which was the first case, is born somewhere here at the beginning of the Andes. It goes upstream, flows into the Caribbean. Any activity that happens on this part of the region sends the uh, poison into the Pacific Basin. At a place called the nursery of the Pacific, this is where whales, um, sharks, various fish and, and mammal species come to have their babies. They go to these areas and they feed on fish that comes poisoned with mercury um, and fish also that we might put on our tables. So in 2016, the court, uh, and, and it perhaps I should say um, in these areas, the state really never got its very dense rainforest jungle. Um, so access services infrastructure are almost non-existent. People in these areas are called amphibian peoples because they basically live in the waters. If you need to, to go from your house to your, your sister, you have to go through the river. Um, so their lives literally happen on the river and when uh, r moving water bodies become lagoons, they have uh, serious difficulties to just move around. Um, later, another ruling by the Supreme Court uh, recognized the Amazon, which is all this green area as a subject of rights. And very importantly, it also recognized the rights of future generations and it created a governance framework where spokespersons for children and youngsters can join um, policy making for um, the management of the deforestation policy because this climate was, this um, particular case was instituted um, by a group of youngsters and children um, saying that the Colombia government was failing to uh, fulfill its commitment under the Paris Agreement, which is zero net deforestation. Uh, and so we see here a number of rivers, Guaitara, Panse, Cauca, uh, several rivers in the province of Tolima, uh, and other rivers that have been uh, recognized as subject of rights. Rivers and paramos. For so, those of you who don't know what a paramo is, it's like nature's freshwater factory. Um, huge plants uh, in a very foggy landscape make uh, the fresh water that then flows uh, with rain and through rivers. And, and the battle of local communities is to halt uh, the exploitation of industrial uh, activities in detriment of these ecosystems. We also see some of, of the rivers that cross the entire uh, country, rivers with the, especially the Magdalena with uh, um, a very big economic and cultural relevance in the country. And all of these have to now be governed with the assumption that someone speaks on behalf of the river. I'll show you later how that works. Um, for now, I want to bring attention to how does a forest look free from mining and logging? You can see a very clear path for the river. Uh, these are the mining 
toxic deserts that are left once the exploitation ends and what used to be a pretty defined course becomes uh, just flooded areas. Here we can see how people literally live on the river. Um, and we can see also, for example, mercury pollution causes deformities in children. It uh, causes spontaneous abortions, different forms of cancer and neurological digestive airways, uh, illnesses, skin diseases, um, and also the land is very rich. People are extremely poor in, in these areas. How does how does it work when the river uh, goes to court? Um, part, of the, part of the predicament of the court is that the adversarial way of justice administration where one party sues the other party and the loser pays money or goes to court doesn't work enough, doesn't do enough justice to the um, uh, conflicts that are being uh, dealt with here. Um, and so rather than continuing perpetuating this adversarial system, the courts are trying to articulate governance frameworks where the ecosystems are represented by a commission of stewards. The ecosystems are uh, represented by a member of the government, sometimes members of local communities. And there is a group of organizations that provide um, assistance to these stewards, NGOs, research centers, scientific bodies, uh, public institutions uh, that are uh, contributing their knowledge and of course the representation of local communities and in the cases where it has been explicitly acknowledged the uh, participation of um, youngsters and future generations. This in a country where the multi-species family has been recognized, where individual members of other species have been also recognized as um, uh, right holders and and, and a place where the contradiction is that although the legal order seems to be robust, there are these power and political economic forces that are still driving conflict. For that reason, um, in the Atrato case, for example, they, they decided to create an experts board, which has functions of supervision and they include a United Nations divisions uh, in the understanding that the economic forces driving the extraction and destruction of these um, ecosystems and the human rights violations that go with it have a geopolitical component and only with the, the um, pressure and the company of uh, the international community can there be more likelihood that um, these conflicts can be addressed at the source? Also, NGOs, the petitioners themselves, uh, ombudsman, uh, some other supervisory entities from the state and universities and academic centers are there to um, contribute and supervise and raise the voice when um, the commission of stewards is not fulfilling their role. Um, and this might seem far from those of you who, who live here um, somewhere far in Latin America, this is happening. But I think um, this, this framework is giving the possibility of thinking differently about the law, about justice, about uh, crafting together mechanisms for interspecies justice, intergenerational justice, epistemic justice with communities that have been historically marginalized. And in the European scenario, we're starting to see glimpses of that. A couple of weeks ago, I understand that within the context of the 
uh, diesel scandal in Germany, a court um, reinterpreted the, the EU charter to say that nature has intrinsic values, uh, uh, intrinsic value, and that for that reason, uh, environmental protections in relation to the uh, diesel scandals where uh, Volkswagen was altering the um, measurement of diesel for to pass the tests but keep on polluting as usual uh, will be playing a role. Um, and so we see uh, a, an increasing interest towards these other forms of law, these new rights that are emerging. And, and I hope that throughout your careers, within the scope of your work as a lawyer in an NGO, in a corporation, as a civil servant, uh, you can think of ways how your organizations can contribute, for example, to this uh, governance framework in terms of knowledge, expertise, or supervision about what is happening there. And with this, I look forward to your questions and your comments. Thank you. Thank you, Jimena, for that fascinating presentation. Now I would like to invite our final speaker, Peter Eckerman, who will be discussing his foundation, Forest, that is its own. It is located in Utrecht, which is fully autonomous and free from human ownership. He will share the practical aspects of this groundbreaking project, along with the challenges and opportunities it presents. Now let's turn to Peter Eckerman to hear more about this project. Now, yeah, it works. See, there you go. Well, thank you very much um, for introducing me and thank you for having me as a speaker here today. Um, I will be telling you a little bit about the work of my NGO because there's been a lot of work um, in the Netherlands discussing rights of nature, but we found it was very important to also do something with the discussion and actually test it in, in practice. So um, the NGO is called Forest that owns itself. Um, it's a term that really wants to show that we criticize the foundation of ownership because uh, we believe that by saying that you own something, it means that you can do with it as you like. Uh, and of course, nature like, is a living creature. We are all part of nature. And if you say, I own nature, it means it's some kind of, like, yeah, if you own it, you can do with it what you want. And that means that you can exploit it. Uh, and we kind of think that if you think about it in these terms, then it's, there's an evenness. Because we are part of nature and we need nature. Nature for the air we breathe is created by nature. The crops we grow in the earth, thanks to nature. The water we drink is cleaned also, thanks to nature. And we need to reinvent ourselves as being part of nature again, instead of placing ourselves above it. And in that philosophy, you cannot own nature in the same way that no one can own us we want to be free of course we had lots of history with uh, people being enslaved there's still slavery going on in this in this time and age but we say that we should not do that anymore if we want to move to live in harmony with nature we have to be free and therefore we want to say that this nature is free and for us that owns itself means that there is no one else that can decide what it can do so um that's, 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 that's the idea, and uh, we've, we have kind of like um, poured it into a mold for rights. Um, and the idea was uh, we're going to give a piece of land to nature, and, and to give it back, we kind of move to a way that you have in some other countries, the commons, that, that the country is owned by no one. Um, but we don't have that in the Netherlands. And there's this false perception that you have tragedy of the commons if no one owns the land then it will be exploited. But this is, in many cases, it's not correct. If you look at cases in Spain, for example, the common lands are actually the lands that people cherish most because everyone feels responsible. Um, so we kind of like drew on this, this, this concept and we thought, okay, we want to give back a piece of forest to itself and how do you do this in practice? Because giving it back to itself, it means that humans can no longer have the right to intervene. And that means that the worth of the land is zero monetarily seen which is a good thing uh, and it also means that you make quite a decision because if you say we give it back to itself 
not for now, but for hundreds of thousands of years, it means you also make a decision for current and future generations. You say, okay, this piece of land is free, and we can never build a road here. We can never build a factory here. We can always keep it as a piece of nature. And for a country like the Netherlands, that where everything is planned, with very high economic activity, and where the loss of nature because of economic activity is, is still going on, this is a difficult decision. Uh, and therefore, we found it very important to kind of like uh, be an example, to be a, a, a pilot, so to say, to see how these things can work. So what did we do? Uh, five years ago, uh, I posted on, uh, on LinkedIn the question, who wants to work with me to create a force that owns itself? And lots of students uh, that I didn't know contacted me, people like you guys. And uh, they said, that's a cool idea, let's make an NGO. And we debated for a very long time, what does it mean to create a piece of nature that owns itself? Are humans still uh, allowed to go into this forest? Um, can we have paths through the forest? Should we have fences around it to protect it? All these kinds of discussions. Um, and also what works for the Netherlands, and the concept that we have works for the Netherlands, but we can very clearly also say it might not work for many other countries. Uh, but what we said is like we take a piece of land, we give it to itself. Humans can be guests in this piece of land, but they have to really see them as part of nature again for them to enter. Uh, and we make very strict rules that humans cannot uh, affect this piece of land. Uh, now, we run around with these ideas, gave many presentations like this. And at some point, there was an uh, estate uh, in Utrecht called Zonheuvel that said, that's a great idea. Uh, we're going to make available a piece of land for a pilot. And as you can see, uh, there's a map here in the middle picture. Uh, they have a, a square piece of uh, their land is uh, with a little bit sticking out. It's, it's, like, it's like a thumb. And they said this, this thumb part uh, is a piece of forest that we haven't been touched for the last hundreds of years. So it's already like on its way to creating its own ecosystem because most of the lands in the Netherlands, as you might know, are either production forests uh, for uh, in, historically for shipbuilding, for mining, or they are recreational forests. Sometimes they share this, uh, this function, or they are uh, indeed for research. But there's very little to know nature for nature. Um, so uh, they said, cool idea, we have this piece of land, we'll do a pilot for 10 years, and if we like it, we will give this piece of land to nature forever. Now that's what we did, but how do you do that legally speaking? Because that's quite difficult, especially in a country as the Netherlands. Um, and for that, you have to go back in time a little bit. Um, I currently live in The Hague, and when I walk in The Hague, I always like to walk in The Hague Forest. And The Hague Forest, if you ever go there, you'll see that this forest is at the center of the city. And it's very special to have a big forest like this in the center of the city. Can you name me any city that has a big forest at the center? Anyone? Exactly. You know why? Because it's one of the first actually pieces of land in nature that in the Netherlands that has a certain kind of right protection. Because back in the days when The Hague was still, it's now our, um, our governing capital of the Netherlands, when it was still a tiny, uh, tiny village, um, and it was bordering this big forest, the Hague Forest. And the reason why The Hague was so popular for many people that lived there, because there was end fresh water, the little lake next to the, to the parliament building that, you, that is still there, and because of the beautiful forest for people, for recreation and for hunting. Uh, and during the 80 years war, 450 years ago, uh, we were in a big fight with Spain. Um, and the local uh, people were asked to cut down the forest so they could sell the wood uh, to kind of like uh, fuel the war machine. Um, and the people, local people during this time were also suffering from an earthquake and most of the town of The Hague uh, was actually destroyed. So the people there were very poor, uh, and there were even questions whether the city of The Hague should maintain here or if they should just stop, make, uh, stop being there altogether and that people would just move away. And they argued with uh, William of Orange and they said like, if you cut down the forest of The Hague, then there's no reason for us to live here anymore. So please don't do it. And uh, William of Orange said, so, sure. Um, but the forest is worth uh, 10,000 
uh, guilders. So please give me that money and then I'll make sure that we will not ever cut your forest down. Well, the people were poor. They just had an earthquake, they were doing war times, but they cared about the forest. So with the last bit of pro uh, with property, they tried to collect money and in the end they paid the bill. And then there was a smart person. We don't know who this was, but he said, William of Orange, if we now buy free this piece of land, we want to have a document that states that it's forever free, that it's redeemed, free of any uh, request, free of guilt, free of ownership. And that's what he did, the Act of Redemption, it signed in 1576. And it's still upholding today. And that's why there's a piece of forest in the center of The Hague. And uh, the forest, you would think it's very old, but uh, unfortunately part of the forest is being bombed uh, during the Second World War. Uh, and also during the French times, uh, they said like, hey, we occupied the Netherlands, this act of redemption, uh, we don't care about it. And, but luckily, um, and, and Napoleon said, we'll cut the forest down, we'll use, use it for money. But luckily there was a civil servant back then that was making the progress so slow and so slow that uh, before the time they finally uh, to finalize the plans and Napoleon was already defeated so the forest stayed um, and that's why we still have a forest in the center of the Hague now I was walking through this forest and thought like hey this is a legal basis to uh, create uh, a practical form of right for nature in the Netherlands and that's what we did we uh, sat together with um, a few smart lawyers and also law students like you guys and uh, we thought like can we revive this idea because the core of the idea is says like this forest can never be cut down and this forest can never be sold to cut down. Now on the basis of that, we started to draw a new act of redemption 2023. Um, and with these 450 years of innovation, we said, okay, okay. Uh, we want to be able to create an agreement between our NGO and a private partner that owns a piece of land. And we want to write down the following. We want to say, um, there will be a qualitative obligation that no one can harm the forest. And it will affect the current owner and every future owner via the chain clause. And we write this down in the land registry. So as long as there will be a legal system in the Netherlands, uh, the land is protected. And if someone would, act, uh, would violate this uh, act, then there will be a fine. And it will be in two parts. First of all, you get a fine of a million euros uh, for violating the, the document. And second of all, there is a right to repair. So if you cut down a tree of 80 years old, you have to replace it with a new tree. And for every day that the original state is not uh, resolved, so the tree being grown the same height and the same age as the tree you cut down, you have to pay a thousand euros. So the prices go up. Because one of the problems with right to nature in some of the countries is that they say, well, right to nature, great idea, but there are no consequences if you violate this right. So we want to make them sure that the economic interests are not there anymore and that it only costs you if you want to damage this forest. So we wrote, uh, wrote these things down, we worked it all out, uh, and now we have a legal document that, that works and we are now uh, going throughout the country to find uh, people to sign it. Um, and a few uh, people are in general very interested to hear these things, they're very enthusiastic. Um, but the people we talk to, they always have also two reservations. Because uh, when we talk to, for example, bigger landowners, we have, uh, for example, insurance companies or uh, people of nobility that have an estate or even the National Forest Agency, they come to us and say like, yeah, but, but, but if you have a forest, you have to uh, manage it. It's like a plant at home, you have to give it water, you have to trim the leaves a little bit. Um, it's not possible to kind of like leave a forest to do its own thing. So, crazy, but that's what the people, and the, especially the, the, the people that are um, employed by the landowners, they have studied, uh, oftentimes agroforestry or uh, nature management or all these kind of things, and they always learned like, okay, um, we have to manage the forest. So. Uh, and we have to we have to tell them again like no come on guys nature could have done well without us it can create its own ecosystem just leave it be uh, the, the, the piece of land might look a little bit uh, ugly for for 30 40 years but then after a while nature will find its own balance 
uh, I say why it looks ugly because most of the forests in the Netherlands are, of course, production forests with only like pine trees, pine trees, pine trees, pine trees, and you just need a while for that to create a new new ecosystem. So that's one of the, the challenges that we have. And the second question we often get is like, how, who am I that I can make a decision for eternity? Because that's as long as a, a legal system is there to enforce uh, what we wrote down, uh, the, the forest can be free. And many people find it very difficult to think that far in the future that that, that choice has so much impact. And then we often give the example of um, of our road network because some of our roads are still based on places where the Roman roads were, so the Romans built a road, and it's still a road 2,000 years later. So to kind of like get people to be warming up to the idea that sometimes we need to make long-term decisions, especially if you want to keep some piece of nature, especially in densely populated countries like the Netherlands, um, for, for future generations. Um, then uh, a last thing, and then I go to the last slide, is like, does this concept also work abroad? Because the Netherlands, this is, this is really tailor-based for the Netherlands, I would say, um, because you really say like humans uh, can be guests to the forest, uh, but not use the forest. Because in the Netherlands, the pieces of, 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 of nature that are like perfectly free from human intervention are very sparse, almost non-existent. So we are very firm on this. but. Uh, we would not recommend introducing this into many other countries because especially uh, if you read your, uh, your books on uh, ecology, then you, for example, read that uh, in Africa, there are also many projects in the past where they said like, hey, uh, we want to create this nature reserve and all the local people that live there, we just drive you off the land and now it's only for nature. And that created lots of suffering and harm and the local people that live there also had a special relationship with the land and with the nature and they probably in many cases, uh, live well in harmony with the nature. So we say, like, because of these, all these bad experiences, uh, don't copy paste our idea to uh, other countries, um, but let's just focus on like, making it work in the Netherlands because of a very different situation than, uh, for example, the, the African uh, African case. So that's that's an important uh, uh, disclaimer that I want to give. Um, now we have talking to many uh, countries, uh, many uh, interested uh, parties uh, throughout the Netherlands. Uh, we have also many meetings within the forest to tell people also about the forest and how the forest works. Because part of the story is, of course, giving rights to nature or actually limiting the rights of humans to destroy nature, because that's what right to nature partially is. But also to make people understand that the rights are a reflection of norms and values within society. So if we don't believe in these rights, then we will not uh, act on them. So uh, a big part of our talk is, of course, about rights of nature, but another big part is bringing people into nature, making, explaining people about uh, how the ecosystems work, how, uh, for example, trees have many very intriguing ways of protecting themselves from being eaten by other animals, or how they can communicate with each other, or how they are important to uh, create oxygen for us, for example. Um, so that we start to revalue, give nature not only value, but also see them as fellow human beings, not very earthlings, so to say, that they are also living creatures with their own knowledge, with their own uh, ways of, of, of survival. Um, so yeah, that was um, a story that I would like to, to, uh, to tell you uh, and to give you also a sense of like, you can do something yourself. We were all young when we started this NGO and we have managed something. And if you have a good idea, maybe based on law, then you can also uh, take some great steps to, uh, to change something because we really need uh, people to think about a future that works for all living creatures on Earth. Thank you very much. Thank you for the insightful presentation. Now let's begin the interactive Q&A panel discussion with our guest speakers. Um, I would like to invite them to the stage. Firstly, I want to start asking a question to Professor Philip Payment. 
um, in your paper, you situate milieu defense versus Royal Dutch Shell within the broader context of a strategic climate litigation, or in other words, impact litigation, describing it as part of a second wave of lawsuits aimed at reimagining the role of corporations in the climate crisis. How do you see the potential of impact litigation, such as this case, to not only influence corporate behavior, but also shape broader societal and legal norms around the climate responsibility? Yeah, thank you for, for that question. Um, it, it's, uh, it goes back to, to what I was speaking about as, uh, as a regulatory failure. I, I think um, we, we continually underestimate the um, amount of governance changes that, that need to take place in order to achieve an, an effective and a just energy transition and respond appropriately to the climate crisis. And, um, and, and despite that there has been you know, increasingly more legislative action to, to lay out a framework for that, it still um, uh, un unbelievably falls short on a lot of different fronts. Uh, and so the courts become a, a very um, uh, logical institution to turn to in a situation like this. I often equate it to um, the scenario when we knew that tobacco products were very harmful and caused massive amounts of costs to our public health systems and caused early death and, and illnesses to millions of people. And we knew it as public available science, legislators knew it and private actors knew it, and still it took years, decades, for there to be effective legislation to respond to this, right? Uh, and that was a regulatory failure. And there are other examples too about certain products, about asbestos products, for instance, where we had similar scenarios where there was just all sorts of political motivations not to um, legislate solutions uh, that were just in maintaining fundamental uh, principles uh, and, and, and fundamental rights. And so the courts offer a, a really helpful uh, strategy for that. Uh, for, for that. Uh, and they offer you know, the right institution, in my view, um, to address what are the specific obligations of different private actors within their competencies, within their capabilities, to um, you know, uh, operate in a way that, that gives the, the due care that they, they owe to their consumers, their stakeholders, and, and others affected by their business. Thank you uh, for the answer. Now I'm turning to Jimena. Uh, in your work on the rights of nature, especially in Colombia, how do you see the influence of indigenous communities in shaping laws that protect natural ecosystems? More specifically, what challenges do you encounter when integrating indigenous knowledge with modern legal frameworks? Um, the, the case on which my research is based the Atrato case, um, the, the court arrives at the conclusion that rights of nature should be acknowledged um, after making the connection that these lands and these territories were part of the culture of the indigenous communities that have uh, started the litigation. Um, and so it's precisely from the indigenous viewpoint uh, that the court felt compelled to enshrine this, right? So, so at, the, at the core, there is a very strong influence on how epistemically uh, the court conceives of the ecosystem, the environment uh, that derives directly from indigenous um, cosmovisions. Um, the challenge, of course, is that when you con conceive of yourself as part of nature um, within the modern framework, uh, implicitly you will have to tweak many um, parts of the machine uh, of the legal order that are based on modern um, or um, principles of law. I, I still contest the idea that these principles are modern in the sense that at least in many of these jurisdictions, the framework of private law, and civil law, public law are severely influenced by Roman law. So to the extent that they are modern, yes, they, but in a way 
the the legal order embeds um, forms of imperialism, forms of extraction of resources, and forms of objectification of living uh, beings, whether human or not, that comes back, way back in time. And so thinking about indigenous worldviews, bringing them into the legal order has the challenge of what do we do with the rest of the legal order. In the Colombian scenario, the constitutional uh, case law runs somehow in parallel with the civil law part, but more and more these indigenous ways start to permeate so that, for example, now when a couple divorces, they are supposed to draw visitation schedule for their pets because now we conceive of a, a multi-species family and uh, the pets are uh, right holders, which means property uh, in the way how modern law conceives it just doesn't work. But these transformations are happening in small courtrooms, one twist at a time. Um, still, I think, in an amazingly fast uh, uh, pace. It's been something that started in 2016, but uh, yeah, it brings many contradictions when you are going to apply valid law, uh, current law, uh, day in the day to day. Thank you for your answer. Now, um, last but not least, I'm moving to Peter. In your efforts to establish the rights of nature in the Netherlands, particularly through the project that you told us in Utrecht, what legal or social obstacles have you encountered? Mm, not many, actually. That's the interesting part. Because we are still having now one uh, pilot running in Utrecht. We have two more pilots running in the east of the country, uh, on the Holteberg, it's uh, near Tiefenter. Uh, and we, have in the, we are in the talks for a few more. And at this point, people that like our idea are our allies, and they speak out and say, oh, that's great, that's great, come and talk here, come and talk there. Um, and since we are still small and under the radar in many regards, uh, that's actually good because we can uh, use this legal way to protect many more pieces of forest and hopefully connect many uh, pieces of nature together in, in the long run. Um, because, and we can do this because many of the big corporations and maybe big people that have power in the Netherlands are not yet aware of the implications because uh, we now made our uh, judicial uh, document also with help from the people within the government that also are in charge of uh, normally um, taking uh, property from people if they want to build a road or something. They really specialize in this and they helped us to make our judicial uh, structure even so strong that we can even at least limit that or maybe even withstand uh, those, those, those acts. Uh, so in the long run, um, we can really be disruptive um, because, yeah, if they want to build a road and we say there's a forest there and you cannot build your road there, they normally are used to carrying on. We used to take money, we use the law, and we just move to nature away. Uh, but our structure is, hopefully, we have to still test it, but that's, that's, that's the idea after the first court case happens, of course, that it, that, it, that it wins, that we are victorious in court and that nature has won for the first time. And then you kind of create a snowball effect of, uh, of, of new kinds of protections. Uh, so, so, so far, it has been very easy. But as the moment that uh, that there will be court cases and people wake up to the to the to the to the concept, then of course it will be much much more different. Okay. Thank you. Uh, now let's move to the audience. Are there any questions to our speakers? Yes. Um, Dirk van Toledo is my, name, uh, is my name from the Nature for Life Foundation. Um, I have a question for ma Madame from uh, Colombia about, um, about your subject. Um, I've seen on one of your slides that the oldest river uh, is now eight years under this regime. Um, what is, the, what is the experience, uh, especially in, in the sense of uh, violation? Um, do you have, a, uh, with that, uh, Colombia created also a kind of ecocide uh, law? Uh, can you explain that? 
Thank you for the question. Um, within the rights of nature movement, there are different approaches as to how legislation should look like. And there are some members of these communities that think ecocide is something that should be enshrined. Uh, I, I would say that's more predominant in the European um, landscape. In the Latin American landscape, I think there is an understanding that justice doesn't um, fulfill the role only through criminal justice. Um, and that these forms of criminal punishment back to uh, the, the Judeo-Christian Judeo -Christian epistem, uh, which is very different from the forms of administration of justice that are um, ancestral uh, in, our, in our countries. And so I, I don't think there is now um, an idea to, to pursue ecocide there. Um, but what started with a, with a ruling, uh, a court decision has cascaded into other court decisions, and then it cascaded also into provinces that created regulations. So some form of legislation for the province, enshrining rights of nature and governance mechanisms, all the way up to a month ago when the first piece of uh, a statutory law was adopted by Congress to uh, recognize the rights of river rancheria, which is a river heavily affected by um, coal mining and where the water in, the, in this area has been almost totally dried up and the local communities living there have run out of water with the uh, terrible consequences for the life and health of these people and for this ecosystem. So, what is happening now is not changing criminal punishment, is, but is new laws at national level uh, that have this uh, enshrinement of rights of nature and the understandings that uh, the new forms of governance, multi-stakeholder uh, policy making will, will inform these frameworks. But because we are also a country crossed by armed conflict. Uh, we are in processes of transitional justice with specific jurisdictions for uh, violations of human rights and crimes committed in the context of the, of the conflict. And uh, in these jurisdictions also, um, ecosystems are being recognized as victims of the armed conflict. Um, but the transitional nature of these jurisdictions means they don't seek necessarily criminal punishment in the form of um, sending people to prison or fines, but rather to find ways to heal and to address the root causes of the conflict and of the violations of human rights and environmental regulations that have taken place. But these are very different forms of, of justice that come within other um, faction of the, of the rights of nature movement uh, that are still work in progress. Thank you. Yes. Uh, hi, thank you so much for all the three insightful presentations. Uh, my question will be for Dr. Payment. Uh, you mentioned that this, the Shell case is a class action because there are uh, so many individuals with the same claim and it will be heard before the appellate court soon. It might be an early question, but can you see this case um, being taken to alternative dispute resolution uh, bodies if they cannot arrive at a conclusion before the appellate court? So, so it's a good question. Uh, no. Um, would be the would be the answer. Um, Shell has no interest in trying to to settle it. Um, and before uh, Milieu Defensi could file 
the, the notice of claim to initiate the lawsuit, they needed to notify um, Shell that they had the intention to do so, that they felt that Shell's business policies were placing human rights at risk. Um, and that notification to Shell includes an invitation to try to come to a negotiated settlement. Um, and so they, there's a built-in requirement to temp test this out before they get to the first lawsuit, and that they didn't. Um, and it's because both parties have no interest in, in coming to an out-of-court settlement. For, for milieu defense, it's important for this precedent to be decided by the court, um, to be used for other industrial sectors where there's not legislative as, as to how to reduce emissions. For Shell, they want no interest in the courts kind of deciding uh, that they need to reduce emissions. Yeah. Are there any other questions? Yeah. If no one else has it. Yeah. Um, I have a question for the first speaker. Uh, you spoke uh, mainly about the climate, but uh, I think we, we have to realize that the climate is only uh, one of the five major nature functions, the so-called uh, ecological services. And they function only when you have a an, an, an maximum of biodiversity. That means that we, we shouldn't, when we um, pollute or we damage uh, nature, then it's not only the climate which is, which is uh, suffering, but also the other, uh, four, um, the other four functions of nature, which is water, which is energy, which is health, and which is food. These are the, 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 the five total functions of nature. So I think um, I appreciate your presentation where you uh, focus on, on climate with the CO2 levels and blah, blah, blah. But it's also all the other, um, all the other uh, functions, they, they, they suffer. So I just want to add that, that uh, yeah, people realize especially that, that uh, the, 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 the climate is not the only problem, but the, what Shell is doing, it's much worse than only uh, suffer the, the let the, uh, our climate suffer. That, that's what I wanted to add. Maybe you have, maybe you have a reaction on that. Yeah, yes, yeah, certainly. Um, I mean, it's, it's important to, to also remind the audience that Shell has, um, has, has been the subject of a lawsuit for uh, immense pollution of the Nigerian River Delta. Uh, they were sued here in the Netherlands as well uh, and, and, and in the United Kingdom for polluting the, the Nigerian River Delta uh, through failing to, to resolve oil spills in its pipeline system there. Um, I, my research here at Tilburg is, is much bigger than climate litigation. Um, and in fact, I was late to this to come here because I was speaking with my PhD researcher who focuses on biodiversity litigation. Uh, so I completely agree with, with what you're saying. In, in many ways, I think that biodiversity law is in a much more precarious position than climate change because of the amount of attention that's been given to climate change. Um, and if, if I had kind of one line to respond to it, I would say that we need to be very careful that we don't lose this opportunity in the energy transition to change fundamentally the way that our economic systems and social systems engage with the living environment uh, and that we don't just shift to a new form of exploitation of nature, that we, we shift then to um, uh, precious, precious minerals and rare earth materials that need to be mined in order to build electronic vehicles uh, and, and um, pollute uh, natural landscapes through immense um, renewable energy infrastructure projects in order to facilitate continued growth of energy demand without considering ways to reduce energy consumption. Uh, and, and I think it's really at risk, to be honest. There's not enough attention for this. Yeah. Thank you. Yep. Just a moment. I have a question for uh, Sir Ackerman. Well, you just mentioned like the fine of one million and an additional fine of like 1,000 per day till the damage is repaired. But this is like more focused on companies, as I assume. But what happens if, if there is something um, when individuals like guests go into forests and when they damage or um, leave waste behind the forest, is there some, some punishment for them as well or nothing? 
Thank you. This is, um, this is an excellent question. Um, we haven't thought about that yet. So we should maybe add that. Yes, well, um, what we say in the tech, if you have the forest, and of course people need to be informed at the edges of the forest that different rules apply and also about what happens if you, if you break the rules. Um, but we haven't added anything about littering. We have thought into looking in, in pollution, for example, indeed like uh, uh, nitrogen pollution, for example, or uh, people dumping uh, chemicals. We were also worried about that, but simply using trash uh, is not something that we have looked into. Um, of course, the, the Dutch state does have uh, fines for people that dump trash on the, on the floor on a, on a normal basis. But perhaps we should add a clause, to, but then with higher fines for this territory that they that they people keep it pristinely clean i think that's a very very good idea thank you um thank you to all our speakers for their insightful contributions today and to everyone in the audience for engaging in this important conversation as we've heard the growing intersection of law and the nature reflects a profound shift in how we view our responsibilities to the environment of courts in protecting our planet Thank you again. I hope this conversation is, inspires further reflection and action. That was all from us. Uh, and I would briefly like to add that we have this one minute survey. If you could scan this uh, QR code with your phone, and briefly fill it in, that would be really great because it helps us a lot also knowing uh, what you thought of this event and maybe you have ideas.